Uh, this is actually the second time we have a, a young earth creationist paleontologist. Uh, the third time we have a paleontologist in general. Uh, if you if you're not f uh, if you don't know, we already had a, an interview with Dr. Marcus Ross, a young earth creationist vertebrate paleontologist, and we also had an interview with Peter Larson. He is a evolutionary uh, vertebrate paleontologist. Um, so, yeah, uh, today he's going to be the third paleontologist I interview via video, and so his name is uh, Dr. Matthew McLean. Um, Doctor, uh, how are you doing? Doing well. All right, great. So today we're going to be talking about dinosaurs, fact and fiction. And uh, if anyone's familiar, if anyone watched the interview with Doctor Ross, he recommended that I sp uh, that I speak to Doctor McLean uh, because a lot of the questions that I asked, he said they those are good questions to ask Doctor uh, Doctor Matt here. So. Um, First off, let me ask you, uh, Dr. McLean, how did you get into paleontology in the first place? Were you an evolutionary guy in the beginning, or was it something that, you know, how did you get into this whole thing? Yeah, so um, I liked dinosaurs ever since I was little. So, I mean, I was the person that, you know, like four or five and six, and I was reading right. dinosaur books and everything. Um, and uh, that kind of just didn't leave. Um, but... I was raised in a Christian home, um, so I remember as a kid having conversations with my parents, you know, my dinosaur books were saying they lived hundreds of millions of years ago or millions of years ago, and, um, you know, my parents were like, well, no, you know, and talked to me from from the Bible, so um, I, I really was a young earth creationist pretty much from the beginning um, and uh, kind of continued on in that, so, um, I mean, they were interesting to me just as animals in of themselves, showing the glory of God and what he made, um, but it was also interesting to me because of the, the faith and science issues that were involved. That's very interesting. So your parents were Christians, right? Mm-hmm. All right, great. So, yeah, so, same thing with me. Uh, that's sort of similar to my story, actually. Like like you said, I, I, I too, also was, you know, very much intrigued uh, with dinosaur books and stuff like that. And that was a area that I really like studying and so one day you know I, I would like write little booklets handwritten booklets I still have some behind me I think uh, about dinosaurs and the ice age and stuff and uh, my mom just told me like look look Johnny uh, you know what, you, what you're saying here in your book contradicts what the Bible says she didn't tell me it was false she just said it contradicts what the Bible says you know, I'm a Christian at the time I'm still a Christian today and I'm like, wow. And so I, I actually, for the first time, gave serious thought to that. And then I upheld the Bible as my final authority at the end. And I'm glad I did. So, uh, doc, uh, Dr. McLean, uh, let, let's talk about, really quickly, let's talk about um, dinosaurs. Uh, what are dinosaurs? Because a lot of people think that they're like these giant lizards, you know, dinosaur, terrible lizard. They're, they're not actually lizards, right? So explain what a dinosaur is to everybody. Yeah, good question. So, um, yeah, you're right. A lot of people think pretty much anything that's dead and big, you know, is a dinosaur. And uh, that's, that's not right. Um, so there's a few different definitions you can use. Um, the original idea, uh, original term was coined by Richard Owen back in the 1840s um, to describe three animals he knew at the time, Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Hyliosaurus. And um, what he recognized even at the time was that these were reptiles. Um, he also recognized that they were very unique. Not only were they big, but lots of big reptiles. Um, they had um, an erect posture he was noticing where their legs were directly beneath their bodies. Um, and today we know of uh, hundreds of species of dinosaurs, um, over a thousand. And so um, the um, basic idea of a dinosaur, that there's one trait, one thing you could really pick out and say, when you see that, that's a dinosaur. It's something called a perforated acetabulum. Okay, so that's fancy words for um, perforated, like a hole, think about a hole punch. Right. Um, and uh, acetabulum is the hip socket. So when you look at an animal that has um, the spot in their, their hips where the femur, um, the thigh bone connects in, um, on a human, it's like a cup right? Um, but in dinosaurs, it's going to be an actual hole. If you go to the museum and you look at the mounted skeletons, you'll see right through there. 
Um, and so that's kind of the trait that um, we recognize as a dinosaurian trait, really the main one. Um, but there's other definitions out there, like phylogenetic definitions that um, would be uh, kind of thinking along different lines, kind of defend it, defining it by the animals that are in the group. Um, but I like to tell people, you know, that's kind of the trait you're looking for to look for a dinosaur. Right. You know, a lot of, a lot of people say, like, when I first got into, like, the Young Earth Creationist debate, a lot of them, the Young Earth Creationists, I'm not going to make mention of any names, but they were like, well, you see the Jackson's chameleon. What if it got to be some 900 years old? You know, lizards never stop growing, and so they get bigger and bigger and bigger. I wonder what they'll, they'll turn into. And it's like that, they're trying to make a point there, but it's not a really a valid point because... Jackson chameleons are pretty far from dinosaurs. Like you brought up the, the the hip socket. Uh, most I think all lizards today don't have that hole through the hips. Um, now we also know that many dinosaurs were warm blooded, if not all dinosaurs were warm blooded. I'm I'm pretty sure you're familiar with those discoveries. Um, and so, no lizard today is warm blooded. Sure. Yeah. Other things too. Yeah. It's it's helpful to think of, um, and pretty much whether you're a creationist or evolutionist, if you're thinking about biology, you got to think about classification in terms of nested hierarchies, right? Um, and so, yes, dinosaurs are reptiles. So a thing like a woolly mammoth can't be a dinosaur. But if you go even narrower in, dinosaurs are archosaurs, um, what we call ruling reptiles. And so they have certain traits, um, certain features in the skull, certain holes and placements of those um, that lizards and other animals do not. So you know, you let a Jackson's chameleon live for 900 years, um, you're not going to get something with a different skull shape. It's not going to happen, right? Right. Um, you're also not going to get a giant animal. So there's this perception that um, because ectothermic cold-blooded animals um, continue to grow throughout their lives, that they'll get like monstrous. But I mean, think about it. We have turtles that live over 100 years and they're not significantly larger than other turtles. <laughs> you know, like it's not like exactly, you right. know they just keep growing and growing to the size of a house. So there's a lot, of, a lot of confusion on that. And, and I think you may bring up a good point that, um, you know, they have these uh, people come up with these simple solutions of think, oh, we just let it live a long time, it'll get huge. Yeah, but it doesn't make it that animal, right? Like if I let a mouse live a long time, it doesn't turn into a an elephant. Like that's not how things work. Um, and so, you know, with, with the, I'm um, talking about warm blooded also, I mean, that's a very contentious topic. Um, every, everyone at this point kind of agrees that dinosaurs were active animals. Um, and we've got really good indicators that they would be, uh, much closer to what we call warm blooded today. But the reality is that the warm blooded, cold blooded dichotomy we draw is too simplistic. There's other options available. Some animals are more warm-blooded in some ways and more cold-blooded other times. Um, but what we can say is that um, activity-wise, a dinosaur would be much more like a mammal or a bird um, than it would be like a crocodile or a lizard. Um, and there's lots of good indicators of that in looking at bone histology and um, thinking about uh, just skeletal construction in general um, and all kinds of different features like that. Right, you know, you brought up archosaurs in a minute, uh, uh, good night, uh, a couple minutes ago, and you know, it, you said ruling lizard, you can think of archosaurs like, have you heard of anarchy, Arc, archosaurs, you know, uh, ruling lizards. So, let's talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of dinosaurs really quickly, because, you know, I, I read uh, Steve Brusati's book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Oh, you have it? Yeah, it's a good book, yeah. Yeah, I, oh, I see it. It's that one right there. Okay. Yeah, I, it was a really neat book. I, I really enjoyed it. But let's talk a little bit about the evolution of dinosaurs because I, after reading that book, I had a couple of questions about Tyrannosaurian evolution. And I asked this um, to Dr. Ross about, you know, Dai Long and Guan Long. Um, so the definition of Tyrannosaurs um, they're basically like these these dinosaurs that have a fused uh, nasal, uh, what's it called, sinuses. They have fused sinuses, fused sinuses, I gotta say that right. Um, that's what makes a tyrannosaur a tyrannosaur. 
And we see that in Dai Long and Guan Long. I believe the first one, uh, I believe that the earliest one we find is Dai Long. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but what's your opinion on that, Doc? Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, when, when they're doing, it, it's kind of co confusing now with classification because we do use features um, as, we, as we look at groups, characters or characteristics, like you talked about fused nasals and things like that. Um, but ultimately, in, in most of what goes on in paleontology, the way they define groups is not actually by the characters they possess, but by the membership of the group. And so when you do, you know, you take all your characters, right, you've got like, say you've got several hundred um, different anatomical features, you plug them into your um, cladistics package, your software, and out pops, you know, many, many trees and you use some kind of method to figure out the best tree, right, the best classification method. And then they'll name the groups of taxa that are there. So for instance, um, Tyrannosauroidea would have a, um, a phylogenetic definition that might be something like, I don't remember off the top of the head what it is, but it'd be something like, you know, um, it could be like node base or, you know, where they say like um, the most recent common ancestor of Tyrannosaurus rex and, you know, die long, for instance, and all the descendants of that ancestor. And they might say something along those terms. Um, so when you're looking at those animals, they definitely share features in common, right? Um, there are little things you can point out with that. I remember the the 2001 paper, um, Hutt et al., about Eotyrannus, um, when they were first discovering a definite non-Tyrannosaurid Tyrannosauroid, kind of a, you know, a stem Tyrannosaurid, if you want to call it that. Right. Um, and they recognized it had features of Tyrannosauroids, like the um, tooth cross-section, the fused nasals, different things like that. And so kind of wondering, what do you do with this animal? So... Um, the uh, progression in evolutionary thought would be you'd have some animal that's like a, um, a basal Solaris or like a Compsognathus or a Solaris kind of thing that um, is going to evolve along the trajectory of, of Dilong. Um, and then you're going to split. You're going to see a group that's going to go off toward Tyrannosaurids and you're going to see a group that's going to go off toward Proceratosaurids, things like Guanlong and Proceratosaurus and maybe uh, Eutyrannus, depending on where it fits in. Um, so... As you're, you know, as you're thinking about those those issues, um, I think you can recognize as a as a creationist, you know, we're we're interested in questions of like created kinds and how much diversification is possible within a created kind and all those kinds of things. Um, and where are those boundaries to be found? So what what we could use is um, something we call statistical baremonology. Um, and there's lots of creationist papers on that using a statistical method to locate areas of continuity where things are similar and where they're surrounded by discontinuity, where they're different. And you might be able to approximate where a created kind's boundaries are. And so um, I actually tried this back in 2014 on Tyrannosauroids um, and, um, you know, published the results using a few different data sets. And basically concluded our best evidence right now, you know, using these results, best interpretation of the results, I should say, is that um, Tyrannosauridae, that family, plus a few other animals would be within the same created kind. So it's basically Tyrannosauridae plus things like Apalachosaurus, um, Zhang Guanlong, and uh, Eotyrannus. Um, and then animals like Dailong, Guanlong, Eotyrannus are actually outside of that group. Um, and so they are there, they seem to be possibly their own or even multiple created kinds outside there. Um, that raises some questions, right? First one is if T-Rex and Eotyrannus are in the same created kind, that's a lot of diversification there. Um, and so when you look at an animal like T-Rex or any of the other Tyrannosaurids, Tarbosaurus or Daspletosaurus or things like that, what you notice is that these animals are designed to kill big things. Like, that's what they're meant exactly. to do. They have these giant heads full of huge teeth. Um, they're serrated. Um, they've, they've got this, uh, these bodies structured for impact, these bites for impact. We've got tons of triceratops and Edmontosaurus bones all across the Lance and Hell Creek formations with Tyrannosaurus bite marks in them, right? So... Um, that's a, it's a hyper carnivore. It's attacking big animals and eating them. Um, such an animal 
wouldn't really be expected in, in the original creation before there is predation, before there is um, carnivory. And so um, we might expect then that that kind has changed since the original creation within you know these boundaries. And Eotyrannus might give us a little bit of a closer glimpse into what an ancestral tyrannosauroid would have looked like. Um, what would um, the created kind of tyrannosaurs look like? It might have been a better better proportioned animal, right? When you look at a T-Rex, that has a huge head and tiny, tiny arms. You look at Eotyrannus, it looks like the arms are better proportioned, more like a typical theropod. Um, now, Eotyrannus is still clearly a carnivorous dinosaur. It's not um, an exact match, but maybe we're seeing a little bit of a trajectory that happened in the pre-flood world of the diversification of that group. Um, the other interesting thing we run into is what do you do with animals like Guanlong, Dailong, um, Eotyrannus? So if they're not in the same created kind as Tyrannosaurus, you know, what are they doing? Well, this is a problem across all living things, right? Why is it that um, a chimpanzee looks more like a human than either one looks like a dog? Um, why is that? And that's the problem of biological similarity. And so um, I think the typical temptation I see for evolutionary biologists is to just, because they know everything, shares a common ancestor in their model, they're just focusing on similarity. And in a creation model, many creationists, because they know they're separate created kinds, they just focus on dissimilarity. But a good method of thinking through creation, right, thinking through the biological world around us from a creationist perspective, biblical perspective, has to combine both of those ideas, um, similarity and dissimilarity, and think through what they mean. Um, and so that's something that a lot of creationists have been working on, and I'm actually working on um, a manuscript right now with with a creationist at um, San Diego Christian College named Ken Colson, um, thinking through what biological similarity means um, in a biblical model. Right. Yeah. That that makes a lot of sense actually. So I'm trying to process a little bit and trying to you know word my next question. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. Um, so a lot of the names that you mentioned there, like uh, uh, Eo Tyrannus and all those, I'm all f I'm familiar with most of those. Uh, you threw out another a couple of them from Asia that I'm not too s familiar with, um, but I've I'm you know I've heard of them, whatever, right? So it's important, like you said, it's important to look at the dissimilarity and the similarity, the similarities at the same time, and so we can't just be focusing on the similarities between animals in order to determine the kinds. We have to look at it through both perspectives. And that's what a good researcher should do at the same time. So let, let's talk a, b a little bit about the, the dinosaurs prior to Noah's flood, right? So what do you think were probably some of the like, I, I've seen this uh, this sort of trend in the fossil record when I studied the dinosaurs. Like, I've asked Dr. Marcus Ross where he where he thinks that the, that the flood boundary is, right? He thinks it's near the end of the Cretaceous or at the end of the Cretaceous, right? Where the KPG boundary is. So my question would be, does, is the lack of diversification of sauropods in the Cretaceous... Um, compared to the Jurassic, does that have anything to play in with the, the, you know what I'm going to say, with the flood, right? The, or why do we see, like, the lack of diversification in the Cretaceous? Yeah, good question. So, um, number one, I, I would say um, I, I lean with, with Marcus. I think that um, the flood, post-flood boundary probably is KPG, um, Cretaceous Paleogene, um, somewhere right around there. And um, I think when we're thinking about sauropods, we're really biased by North America. Um, <laughs> right. We're so used to thinking about North America as the standard of dinosaurs, but it's not, right? It's just one continent among others. And when you look at the other continents, sauropods are there and they're doing stuff, right? So you do have Alamosaurus in North America, but but you go down to South America, you know, you're not going to find abundant ceratopsians, right? You're, you're going to find tons of sauropods, huge diversity of sauropods. In fact, you know, um, 
if you're looking at Cretaceous as a whole, we, we still have diplodocoids, we still have non-titanosaurian uh, macronarians, we have tons of titanosaurs. And the rest of the Cretaceous, I mean, it's just a titanosaur world, right? And there there's tons and tons of species of them. I mean, it's the most diverse group of sauropods. So um, I don't think um, sauropods were um, any less diverse in the Cretaceous than they are in the Jurassic. They might be, you might have less um, larger groups represented, like you no longer have diplodocoids in the upper Cretaceous. You no longer have brachiosaurids or camarasaurids in the upper Cretaceous. Um, but I think that sometimes it's it's tempting to see a pattern in North America and infer it for the whole world. And you got to remember the flood is worldwide, right? So right. Um, I think why don't we find sauropods in in the Cretaceous of North America for the most part, especially upper Cretaceous? Um, I think it's because they didn't live in those ecosystems. Um, so when you look at the the typical Lancian, Helcre, even Campanian stuff, um, it's Ceratopsians, Hadrosaurids, Tyrannosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs, and Kylosaurs, you know, and some Troodontids and, and things like yeah, that. Weird those are the animals. Stuff. Yeah, like like those are the things that lived there. Um, I, I don't think sauropods were, um, were part of their ecosystems um, in the pre-flood world. And... Um, you know, the the plants that are there really match with the kinds of animals that you're seeing. Ceratopsians and, and hadrosaurids really look like they like to eat, um, you know, the the flowering plants and the, and the conifers and things that are there. Um, you're not seeing a lot of cycads, for instance, or cycadioids. Um, but the sauropods we have in the Jurassic and North America, they're in those cycad dominant environments, along with stegosaurs. Um, so it just could be that those ecosystems never had sauropods in them in the pre-flip world. Right. That would, that would actually make sense. Uh, so let's talk a little bit past KPG boundary. Uh, we're, we're going to divert from dinosaurs for a minute. Um, <laughs> we're going to get back to it in a minute, guys, but, uh, just hang on with us. Uh, so after the KPG boundary, we have the... Uh, the, uh, the, what the, I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing, uh, the name's slipping out of my mind, but the Cenozoic, right? You have all these Ice Age creatures, and you have these layers, not as many layers as there are in the, in the Mesozoic, or even in the Paleozoic. Where did those layers come from, if they didn't come from the Flood, in your opinion? Yeah, great question. So um, I think we have a temptation as creationists, um, and it comes from way back, I think even George McCready Price, and even with the Genesis Flood, um, with uh, Henry uh, Morris. Come and Morris. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have this temptation to think that, like, if we see fossils, it's Noah's Flood. <laughs> like, we just instantly are like, we see big layers, oh, it's got to be Noah's Flood. Like, and, and I think that's understandable, because, like, we were reacting to scientific discoveries that were pushing Noah's flood out of all those things, right? And because we know Noah's flood is, is a global event, it's going to create erosion, it's going to create deposition, it's going to make fossils, it's inevitable. And so um, we start thinking that way. But the reality is um, you can make, um, you know, fossiliferous bone beds, for instance, with other catastrophic events. So um, I would think that you know, you imagine the world um, post-flood, let's say, okay? The flood is up here in, in the level of catastrophe, right? Total right. annihilation. Right. Um, as you get to the present, it's not just a sudden change. It's it's a gradual change, right? And in fact, um, you could say it's logarithmic or negative exponential curve here, however, however you want right. to think about it in your mind, um, that it's, it's a gradual um, calming down of the world, okay? Um, well, the world and is so sort as of healing, result, right? Yes, the world is sort of healing. Yeah, so you're going to get big volcanic eruptions, um, large local floods, uh, massive hurricanes, you know, big earthquakes. These kinds of things are going to keep happening as the world tries to reset itself, as it tries to find its balance, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and, you know, this could be, um, I know, I'm just giving you a hypothesis here. I'm not right. saying this is for sure what happened, but um, that could partly explain why people don't want to leave. Uh, the plain of Shinar um, after the flood, right? Because the world is a chaotic place. It's a scary place. They just had a global <laughs> flood. Right? People are people are are not so comfortable just wandering out, whereas the animals just go straight out. So um, just like whatever. I think that that yeah, and I think that also helps us understand why there aren't 
human fossils in the earlier Cenozoic deposits because humans are living in one place in the earth. They're not spreading all over the place. And so um, they're not around to leave fossils in these catastrophic deposits. So, um, you know, that, that's my, um, my take on what's going on there, that I think you're seeing a lot of post-flood catastrophes. And when you look at Cenozoic deposits, they're not talking about ocean ones, just ones on continents, um, they are very localized for the most part. So a good example of this is the Green River Formation in, in um, Utah and Wyoming and Colorado. It's, it's a big formation. You know, it's like the size of, of a good-sized state in the United States. But that's nothing compared to Paleozoic and Mesozoic deposits, right? You look right. at the Chin Lee Formation, the Morrison Formation. They'll stretch across 10 states, you know. Um, right. they're, they're enormous blankets of, of uh, sediments. Um, the Cenozoic is much, much more restricted kind of to, to localized basins. Right, that would actually make a lot, a lot of sense. So, uh, just to basically summarize what you were saying, basically the whole world, you know, you have this huge flood, and then the world is sort of healing after that. And and then it's, the, the waters are still just calming down a little. They're still, like, receding. It wasn't just, like, this huge rapid change, right? Like, people point to the valley sank down and the, the mountains rose up and the valley sank down, right? They think like, oh, it was like, no, no, it was probably like, like slower, probably faster. That, But, you know, um, when we think of the start of the flood, that's essentially a nearly instantaneous event, right? Now, it may leave its evidence over a period of time, you know, over a few days or something. But the end of the flood we're kind of still in the end of the flood, if you want to think of it that way, right? We still have effects of it. Um, and so it got to the point where the waters were low enough or the continents were high enough that Noah and his family and the animals could get out. But the world is still, you know, it's, that doesn't mean that, that the effects of the flood are done, if you want to think of it that way. Uh -huh. the, the, you could think of them as the, um, <laughs> I'm the geologist and I can't think of the term, <laughs> aftershocks. Okay, the aftershocks of the flood, if you want to right. think of it in that sense. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that would also, like, you, you explained how that would also probably explain why the Cenozoic covers a lot less geologic uh, area than it, than it does in the other uh, uh, geologic times, if you want to, if you want to say times, right? So let, let's really talk, uh, let's really quickly go back in quote-unquote time, right? Let's go, let's go a little bit back. Well, you have to go back in time a little, even in the Noah's Flood, but... Let's talk about the impact uh, that caused the KPG boundary, that most likely caused the KPG boundary. What's your opinion on that? I asked Dr. Ross this question, and he gave a pretty good explanation. I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> so we have really good evidence that an asteroid or something like that um, collided with the Earth in the Yucatan Peninsula um, and right at near that boundary, right? Um, You've got the crater itself, which is buried. Um, you've got shocked quartz. You've got tectites. You've got iridium layer. Um, I mean, you've got that new site in Dakota where they're they're showing tsunami deposits potentially from that. I, I think it's a pretty clear event that happened. Um, although there's some people that disagree, but I, I think we've we've gotten to the point now where we can say, yeah, that that looks like that happened. Um, and so in our model, it would be sometime near the end of the flood. Um, that it looks like that happened and um, you know it would have been a pretty pretty catastrophic event as part of a catastrophic event um, and uh, you know the uh, the recovery from that event in the evolutionary model they talk about there being a fern spore spike where the first plants to kind of really recolonize on a big scale are, are ferns um, and then you get into you know other kinds of plants that would make sense in a creation model as well. That as the flood finishes, those plants are going to take off like a storm. Um, if you think about when they talk about ecology recovery, right? Um, you have like a volcano or you know deforestation or something clears an area. You have this um, primary and, and secondary growth that comes in, right? The, the first wave of plants and then the next wave of plants that recolonizes. And and the first wave is stuff like ferns. Um, and so that would make sense in a post flood scenario also. Um, so it does look like it coincided. I think it really did. I think the asteroid in particular, um, it looks like it probably did have some effect, especially on marine ecosystems with the, um, uh, increased, um, potentially the increased, 
um, acidity of the water and, and uh, causing problems for calcareous nanoplankton and, and a collapse of the food chain. Um, but, you know, the flood is also going on. So it's hard to like tease those out, right? Like which one's causing which. Um, but, you know, I think we've got good evidence to say that that happened. Yeah. Like, like when I became, when I first became a young earth creationist, I wasn't always a young earth creationist. Like, like I said, I, before my mother told me that the Bible contradicted what I was reading, um, I was an old earther. You know, I would learn something in children's school. I mean, not children's school, in that children's church. And then I would learn something in my books and in my science class. And I say, well, if someone at church asks me how old the earth is, I'm going to say 6,000. But if someone at school tell, asks me how old the earth is, I'm going to say, you know, well, the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, right? So that, that, sort, of, that was sort of my... Uh, mental thinking and so after I become a young earth creationist I was sort of battling with like like the facts right did dinosaurs have feathers did was was there actually an asteroid that by the way folks dinosaurs did have feathers okay <laughs> so um it was the ash did the asteroid actually happen what about the ice age all this other stuff right and it was sort of hard for me and I think like these interviews and and listening to people like I'm, I'm going to throw out Kent Hovind for a minute because he, he actually helped me a lot. Um, so listening to people like Dr. McLean, Dr. Ross, Dr. Hovind, you know, they actually helped me a lot in my, in my walk here. Now, I, uh -huh. I, I'm glad to hear that, you know, that, that those things are hearing from people is helping you. I think what you're doing is exactly right. Um, it's asking questions and, and seeking answers, right? right. Um, and going back to the scriptures as your starting place. Um, the reality is that a lot of people, I think, are actually like you um, and that they have these questions. They have this debate in their head. They don't know how to relate dinosaurs to other stuff. But instead of investigating it, they just drop it, you know, and they hope that sooner or later it will make sense for them. Um, and my encouragement is, you know, um, God gave us brains. He wants us to use them and, and, uh, he wants us to have wisdom and discernment. And, you know, um, if, if Christianity is true, which it is, the Bible's true, right, it is, right. then it provides the worldview for understanding everything, right? If, um, God, God made everything. And so if you're, um, you're, you're not going to take one piece of existence and separate it out from you know, what the Bible has to say, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it, that, that Christianity, you're, you're thinking on who God is, it permeates everything. Um, and so, you know, my encouragement to, to people who will be listening would be, you know, do exactly what you did. Um, seek out um, those kinds of answers and talk to people and, and um, think about it, wrestle with it. It's a good thing to, to wrestle with it as long as you, you come back to the word of God and, and admit, you know, hey, I'm a finite person, right? And, and I've got problems, I've got sin, I've got just, you know, finiteness and so like i'm not going to totally understand everything but it pleases god when we um seek to understand things according to you know who he is right exactly so let's talk about pangea really quickly now for everyone that's watching i accept pangea that's you know i do believe that there was a supercontinent at some point in the earth i'm still trying to decide whether it, God created the earth with like Pangaea or should I shift more towards what Dr. Ross says like uh, during the flood I think this is what he says I'm, I forgot if I heard this from him but you know the Pangaea sort of was formed during the flood and then sort of diverted away after that um let me ask you about that doc yeah so um, we've got really good evidence that the continents used to link together in Pangaea. Um, I, I think that's, um, you know, first of all, we know continents are moving today. We can measure it um, with just using satellites and probes all across the Earth. And, you know, it's, it's actually measurable. It's something you can watch happen, um, you know, with looking up data on your computer. Um, and we can reconstruct where the continents were using fossils and rocks and things. So, yeah, I, I think you're right to say that Pangaea was real. Um, the question is, what happened before Pangaea? And we do have good evidence in the Paleozoic that you have continental collisions um, and continental movement. And so, because Pangaea is supposed to come together at, um, right. in the Triassic, Permian-Triassic. So um, what, uh, what 
Marcus Ross was talking about, I'm sure, and, and um, I would agree with him on this, is that there was an original supercontinent, we think, um, when God created the Earth. And some people call that Penosha, some people call it Rodinia. Um, and that would have, we think, split up at the beginning of the flood, combined into a different arrangement during the flood, and then finally went to its its modern places. Um, and so um, you would have actually had Pangaea in that model form during the flood. One place you can, you know, one quick visualization for you, um, the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern United States, um, that mountain range continues into the Atlas Mountains in Africa and the Scottish Highlands. Um, it's all one giant mountain range. Um, if you put the, the continents back into the Pangaea arrangement, you'll see that that's a big mountain range. So the thinking is that that mountain range formed when those continents collided with each other. Um, so, yeah, so you, you need to have the collision to make that. Um now, in terms of, you know, did God make it ex nihilo during the creation week? Boom, here's a supercontinent. Or did he, during, you know, day one to day three of the creation week, combine continental plates to make a continent, um, you know, at a rapid speed? That's something we could think about. And uh, it suggests a really good book on this topic is called Creation Unfolding. Um, it's a new book. It came out last year. And uh, the author is Ken Colson. Yeah, I think it's on Amazon. Sorry about that, folks. I had to mute my mic for a minute. Um, so now you brought up, uh, you know, what Dr. Ross thinks. And what I would bring, if you were to bring that up to any evolutionist or someone who doubts the Bible's, legitimacy they would say well you have a giant heat problem there you know you have the raining and then you have the plate tectonics you have the heat from the mantle that's going out to the water it's gonna boil the earth what would be your response to the heat problem well i'd start by saying number one i'm not a geophysicist <laughs> i'm a <laughs> right, paleontologist right, yeah. um but what i would say is uh they're right there's a problem there um and every scientific model has um, has issues, right? That's that's how science works, right. is we suggest ideas, and then people and attack it. those ideas with new things. Yeah, we refine it. And so um, I think that's a perfect opportunity for someone to step in and start doing some work. Um, and so there are people doing that. The last, um, I think, was it the Origins Conference or ICC? I think it was the last Origins Conference. Um, there was some work on determining how to... Um, explain the heat problem during catastrophic plate tectonics. There are people working on that. Similar problem for how do you cool plutons and batholiths quickly, um, the radiometric decay, you know, how does that not kill things? Um, you know, what, what I think it's important for people to remember is that the flood is catastrophic. Right. Those kinds of things probably did kill a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, I think these are perfect areas for investigation. You know, people have this temptation, like they hear, Here's a model. Oh, that sounds good. Oh, but there's a problem. Okay, well, fine. I'm dropping the model. It's nonsense. Yeah, right. Well, no. Like, you, you can do that with wrong. anything. Right, exactly. So, like, but we investigate it. And, um, you know, if if we look after issue after issue, issue after issue, and we realize nothing's really working, maybe it's time to go back and reanalyze this. Maybe we've got a wrong idea here. But the reality is we do know that the plates moved. We've got good evidence that, or that they continue to move. We, we've got good evidence that Pangea is real and even pre pangeic movements so you kind of have to say, well, something happened, right? And if and if you have a young Earth, there's got to be something along those lines. So I've heard one person say, you know, maybe God supernaturally removed the heat. And I'm very uncomfortable with that because, number one, I don't think you should invoke supernatural, it's actually, uh, supernatural acts of God unless he says that he did them. And number two, that, that's just God of the gaps thinking, right? That's yeah. that's exactly the kind of thinking they use in the Middle Ages. What moved the planets? Oh, God does that. You know, anytime you don't know something, God does that. Well, that's not helpful. That's not that's not scientific investigation, right? Um, now you, so we, now here's the thing: though. you could say that if you're like doing like religious thinking, but you can't say that necessarily if you're doing scientific thinking, right? Yeah. So, well, here's what I'd say. Um, okay, you read Psalm 104. For instance, uh -huh. um, God touches the mountains and they smoke. Um, the lions roar for their food and God brings it to them. God causes the springs to go forth and the streams go down and water the plants. God causes the rain. Okay. The psalmist says all those things. Does the psalmist literally believe 
that, you know, God rings the dinner bell and the lions come up and they roar and he hands them, you know, zebra carcasses. Like, no, that's ridiculous. Right. Um, what he's saying, he's expressing God's care for the natural world through the natural processes God has made, right? And I think as Christians, we have this temptation to think that God is only involved when there's a miracle or a supernatural act. But that's not true. That's, that's completely false. God is just as involved in the everyday natural processes as he is in the supernatural processes because he ordains both of them. And so, um, you know, it's right to say God took care of heat during the flood. Now, how did he do that? I don't know. I don't like the idea of saying he supernaturally did it because I think it's unnecessary and confusing. But I'm sure that there are plenty of natural mechanisms he could have used. And when you look at the way God uses miracles in the Bible, there's a principle you could call it like the conservation of miracles or something like that. Not in the same sense of conservation energy. Conservation in the sense of not using them all the time, right? So, um, for instance, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, okay? Um, and then he's like, now go and take the burial cloths off him. Well, hold on. He just rose the guy from the dead. He could have just rose him into life in a new right. suit, right? right yeah. And and before that, he tells the people, move the stone away. Well, if you can raise somebody from the dead, you could go like that and the stone would roll away, Right. But God tends to use natural processes for the most part and supernatural, the actual miraculous processes really aren't used that much when you look at it in the Bible. Um, another, you know, there's other interesting examples of this. Like, for instance, um, when, when God parts the Red Sea, when the Israelites are, are crossing, um, it says he caused a great wind to come up and push the water to one side. And you're like, well, hold on, that's kind of unnecessary. Couldn't you just like make the water stand still, stand up? You know, he could do that, right? But he didn't. He chose to use the wind. And so there's a little bit of mystery that's there. I think that's good. But I think what we see is that God uses natural as much as he uses supernatural. Exactly. And so to just automatically jump in and invoke supernatural because we don't know an answer yet, you're not being, I think, a good scientist at that point. You need to, to be patient. You know, is it a possibility? Well, sure it is. But there's other possibilities we can investigate as well. Exactly. Now, bringing back to the thing about the post-flood occurrences, right? You know, back to the uh, sorry, sorry about that. Back to the uh, the fact about you know the flood the flood waters receded, uh, but it was a slower process. Um, how would that play into the ice age? Unfortunately, um, you know, I mainly work on Mesozoic stuff. I do a little bit of Cenozoic here and there, but um, right. the climate modeling for Ice Age stuff is not um, as settled, I think, as we used to think as creationists. Um, so a big guy who's worked on this for a long time is Mike Ord, um, who's a meteorologist. And, um, you know, he's, he's had some really good ideas, I think, about the relationship between the flood and the Ice Age. Um, but as we've learned more about the geology involved and the paleontology and all those kinds of things, the, the link is a little more confusing than it used to be. And so, um, new research, I would suggest checking out, there's a guy named Steve Golmer, who's at Cedarville. Um, he did a, a paper in the, at the International Conference on Creationism, as well as some abstracts at the, uh, Origins meetings, which are the Creation Geology Society and Creation Biology Society. And um, he's been doing work and trying to model the climate that would lead to the Ice Age. Um, and so he's using very sophisticated, the kind of um, uh, software that they use to forecast the weather and, you know, over continents and things like that. And he's trying to model, like, what what kinds of factors could lead to an Ice Age. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the warm oceans are a part of it, although we do see fluctuating ocean temperatures in the Cenozoic. Um, what I will say, I think a big factor is the separation of Antarctica um, from South America and Australia. So when you look at um, right at the KPG boundary, Antarctica is still close enough to South America and Australia that animals can cross between those continents. And in fact, that's what we see in the Eocene fossil record and Paleocene fossil record. Um, but soon afterwards, that connection stops. And we start seeing evidence of cooling temperatures in Antarctica and the formation of big ice sheets. And so something going on there has an impact on, on the, the beginning of an ice right. age. There's like a weird um, climate shift, right? 
Yeah, and you're you're seeing the the development of grasslands across the continents. You're seeing um, a circumpolar current under on the, on the South Pole surrounding Antarctica. Um, you know, a lot of different factors like that. Um, and so immediately after the flood, if the flood is at the KPG boundary or near there, you actually have a some of the warmest time in Earth history. Uh, we call the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And so um, you'll see, for instance, there's there's really cool deposits up in like um, today, what is Arctic Circle um, Canadian islands up there? You know, I can't remember exactly which island, like Ellesmere and those kinds of islands. Um, they've got fossil deposits there of essentially, um, you know, deciduous or coniferous forests with um, large mammals, small mammals, all kinds of fun things up there. Um, and it's in the Arctic Circle even at that time. So it was much warmer immediately after the flood. And then we see this cooling down um, to the, the peak of cooling down or the trough, however you want to think of it, which is the, the Pleistocene Ice Age um, with the woolly mammoths and all that kind of fun stuff. And then the, the world starts um, warming after that. Exactly. Now, we were supposed to talk a little bit more about dinosaurs <laughs> tonight, but we sort of went on. Yeah, let's talk about feathered dinosaurs, like uh, Cynonothosaurus. So that's, that's actually my favorite dinosaur. Um, so Cynonothosaurus is actually a very interesting specimen, um, and you probably know why. <laughs> but uh, let, let's talk about feathered dinosaurs, actually. Yeah. So um, when I started my career in paleontology, I said, I don't want to work. There's two basic things I don't really care to work on. And those are T-Rex and uh, feathered dinosaurs. And so far, my only creationist publications on dinosaurs are on T-Rex and feathered dinosaurs. <laughs> so that kind of backfired. Um, but um, yeah, I, I worked with um, two other colleagues and we, we wrote up a, a paper on feathered dinosaurs for the International Conference on Creationism. We presented that back in 2018. And... Um, you know, basically what we wanted to say is, are there feathered dinosaurs? How many created kinds are there? And how do we understand those from a creation model? So, um, you know, reviewing the fossil evidence, we said, yeah, there are animals that we call dinosaurs that have feathers. That's that's a for sure. Um, the the second thing was we used bear on, on several different data sets. And we did, you know, just tons and tons of analyses on it. And we came up with there, we're estimating something like at least eight seven or eight created kinds of feathered dinosaurs among the theropods, um, Celerosaurian theropods. Um, then the question is, what does all this mean, right? Um, and so we had some assumptions as creationists that I think were logical, but not necessarily right. right. Okay, so I'll give you an example. You look at the world today, and the world today um, you can clearly delineate five different types of vertebrate animals, right? There are mammals, there are birds, there are reptiles, there are amphibians, and there are fish. Um, they're very obviously distinct. And so what we said is, well, they must have always been very obviously distinct. And, that and then we went to the fossil record, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and it turns out, oh, it's not actually as those neat groups I like <laughs> to see today right. don't really fit the past. It's like that weird assumption that, and then you're all surprised when you find bird-like dinosaurs or dinosaur-like birds or whatever, right? Right. And so the problem is, and I want to be careful how I say this, I think creationists have kind of fallen into uniformitarian thinking. We've thought that the present is the key to the yeah, past. That's... But we know in geology, we talk about this all the time, right? It's not the key to the past. Not always, anyway. And here we go. We've got dinosaurs of feathers, among other kinds of animals that are interesting. Um, and so we made another assumption too, which I think was flawed, was that um, if a dinosaur has feathers, that means dinosaur to bird evolution is true. That's a terrible assumption. Um, God could create an animal with feathers that we didn't even know existed. That's fine. Just because birds today are the only animals with feathers doesn't mean there can't be a larger category of animals that also had feathers. And so, um, you know, you hear people, you hear evolutionists say things like birds are living dinosaurs. And, you know, creationists get very upset about this because, hey, no, like birds didn't evolve from dinosaurs. I agree with you. Birds are created on day five. Land dwelling dinosaurs would have been created on day six. However, think about an analogy of mammals. Some mammals were created on day five, like bats. And other mammals were created on day six, like, you know, cows. So when we say mammal, 
we mean a taxonomic classification. We don't mean anything related to the creation week. Exactly. In the same way, you could say dinosaur or reptile and include birds inside of that, and that'd be fine. It's just a classification scheme. It's just you're just describing internal anatomy and DNA similarities and things like that. You're you're not talking about how God made them necessarily. And so um, that's where I think a lot of the confusion comes in. Um, it's okay for God to have made dinosaurs with feathers. That's that's not a problem. Um, and it's unfortunate that we have this um, this kind of uh, antagonism sometimes in creationism toward similarity. We're kind of scared of the idea that, well, you can't say that that animal looks like that animal. It's like, but it does, right? <laughs> so exactly. yeah. we should be able to say that. And so I think we're so scared of sounding like evolution, so scared of giving them a win of anything that sounds like that, that we can end up saying things or, or thinking things that aren't really accurate. And so um, what we want to do as creationists, well, like I said before, if the biblical worldview is true, and it is, it should allow us to interpret reality. Feathered dinosaurs are a part of reality. So how do we interpret them? How do we think through them? And I think we've got to come into this saying, my assumptions about the biological world were not entirely accurate. You know, and so going back and rethinking that. So we talk a lot about that in our paper. And uh, the, do you mind giving me, like, the name of the paper so I can, like, read yeah, it? Yeah, it's or... called, I think it's called Feathered Dinosaurs Reconsidered. Okay. I think that's the title. Okay. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can always send you a link to it later right, or something. Sure. But it's it's in the International Conference on Creationism uh, 2018. All right. Well, I got to read that because that's going to be a very uh, good read for me. Uh, someone in the chat asks, his, uh, his YouTube name is Too Done. He says, can we just call dinosaurs with feathers birds? What was the purpose of feathered dinosaurs? Um, I guess I could weigh in on that first, and then I'll let you get your opinion on that. Um, yeah. So if, if you were paying attention to the earlier part of the stream, we were actually giving some distinct um, differences between, uh, you know, uh, dinosaurs and other, you know, reptile reptiles and other living things there are certain characteristics that dinosaurs had that no other animal has today or had back then so no not necessarily you can't call dinosaurs with feathers birds because we know that a lot of dinosaurs that were not smaller like sign on the source or microraptor we know that bigger dinosaurs had feathers like uh, I believe Nano Tyrannus, which a li uh, one of the latest studies actually, I think they proved that Nano Tyrannus is actually a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, but yeah, so if Nano Tyrannus is a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, then we find feathers on Nano Tyrannus. That means that Tyrannosaurus rex had feathers. So at least at some point of its, of its life. So you have. Larger dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex with feathers. I believe Tarbosaurus had feathers. I believe, I think a lot. Most of the theropod dinosaurs had feathers. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the problem with saying like feathered dinosaurs are just birds. So, what what's your opinion on that? Yeah. So, uh, some similar things and and a uh, little bit of distinction and stuff. Um, if you wanted to call every animal that has feathers birds. You can do that. I mean, be my guest. Like that's in our paper, we talk about folk taxonomy, right? So, for instance, um, I have no problem calling all insects bugs. I just don't, right? Um, to me, it's a bug. But I have entomologist friends that are like, no, a bug is a very specific kind of insect. Right. Um, and they're like, they won't call ladybugs, but ladybugs, they call them ladybirds because they don't want people to be confused. And I'm like, but it's also not a bird. So, anyway, <laughs> different discussion. Um, but. When you're thinking about that, yeah, if you want to call those animals um, birds, you can certainly do that. But what it means is you'll be including animals like Velociraptor, um, Ornithomimids, Therizinosaurs, um, animals that we don't typically think of as birds. You're going to have to start calling them birds. Um, and included in there will be Tyrannosauroids. So we don't currently have any fossils that I know of of Tyrannosaurus or Tarbosaurus with feathers on them. But we do have Eutyrannus, um, Dailong, and um, some other ones, some Chinese ones that have feathery like filaments on them. Um, and a lot of this depends too on what you're calling a feather and that gets complicated too because there are different structures that, um, you know, 
might be homologous with feathers, might not. And so as a result, um, if you're sticking with what's a definite true feather, you're at least including things like Velociraptor, Ornithomimids, um, Oviraptorosaurs. You'd have to call all those birds, which, like I said, if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but you still have to recognize that we've been calling them dinosaurs for decades. And it's not because we were ignorant. It's because anatomically they're dinosaurs, exactly. right? Um, so like it, at that point, it's easier in a sense to think of it this way. And this is how I think of it currently. And, and if you think of it differently, that's okay. But I tend to think of it as here's birds, right? Here's all feathered animals. Okay. So birds included in the feathered animal group are birds as well as other animals with feathers like you know, Velociraptor, um, Tyrannosaurus, things like that. And then farther out, you'd have dinosaurs, archosaurs, reptiles. Um, other people want to think of a different classification system. That's okay. You know, you can have your own folk taxonomy. Um, but just to make it clear, there are very clear anatomical similarities between these animals, dinosaurs, and with birds. Right, exactly. Exactly. Um, Valid Core in the chat says, T-Rex looks like kangaroo. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Old toys of a T-Rex, it looks like a kangaroo. <laughs> uh, so there's two reasons for that. One, back in the day, they used to reconstruct them with that kind of upright posture where they're leaning back on their tail. Yeah, I know. What um, but then um, the other thing is it helps the toy stand up, right? <laughs> it's really <laughs> hard to make a toy where its tail sticking out like this and keep it balanced. So, uh, but no, I, I don't think... Uh, I don't think they'd be keeping their babies in a pouch or anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I I'm I think I read in Steve Brusati's book that I think Barnum Brown sort of like popularized that sort of posture in T Rex because he sort of like moved the the hip bone a little bit so that it could just stand up. You know. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Part, but yeah, I mean that that sounds plausible. <laughs> Um, I also want to point out, kangaroos spent a lot of time on all fours, um, and T-Rex did not spend a lot of time on all fours. <laughs> that would actually be a little difficult, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Brother Garcia says in the chat, doesn't the Bible consider whales fish? Mm. So, that's that's a good point. Um, that, that one's a little bit tricky because um, there aren't a lot of passages that talk about whales. Um, you know, we think of Jonah and the whale, but really it says Jonah and the fish. Um, so, you know, it, maybe it's a whale, maybe it's some other kind of big, big aquatic animal. Um, but certainly a lot of people did call whales fish. Um, and the uh, I think the best example of this kind of thing is in, in Leviticus, it refers to bats as a type of bird, right? Um, so what's Moses' point there? First of all, his point is don't eat them. Okay, that's the point of the context. But but in terms of you we're know, what hearing mean, coronavirus uh, because of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, his point is um, to talk about hey, here are all the things you shouldn't eat. I'm going to separate them into categories: the things that are on the ground and the things that are in the sky. You know, and the things that are in the sky, we're just going to call these birds. And if you think about it, a bat is functionally a bird, right? You can use that classification system, and that's fine. Moses isn't trying to make any statement about their deep internal anatomy, right, or their genetics. He doesn't care. I mean, maybe he does. I don't know. I don't know Moses. <laughs> but the point is in the passage, that's not the point of the passage at all. And so the Bible can use its own taxonomic scheme that's helpful for the people, and it doesn't invalidate a scientific scheme, right? So let me give you an example of this. And we talk about this in our paper. Um, in Papua New Guinea, um, there are some tribes that, um, or I should say New Guinea, I don't know which side it is. Um, there are some tribes that uh, that have a category for what they call, um, what we might call birds or flying things. They put bats and birds in that same category. But the flightless bird, native to New Guinea, the cassowary, they don't put in that group. Right, because okay. it doesn't fly. But other people in New Guinea have a different classification scheme where they put cassowaries in the same group as birds. So, um, you know, that's that's just different cultures trying to understand the world that's around them. Um, and that's that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it can be true to that culture. Um, and so the, the way that animals are described in the Bible is perfectly true. Um, but it may not line up perfectly with the way we describe them in a scientific setting. Right. Yeah. The the Bible is not like a classification book. It's not trying to tell. You. Yeah. Purpose because um, everything God says about animals in the Bible is true, um, but 
you know, uh, let me give you another example. You know, the Bible refers to, it'll say things like, oh, the sun rises or the sun sets, right? The Bible is not making an astronomical claim. Right. It's just talking about human experience um, and using phrases we understand. Um, and so, you know, our observations in astronomy can still be true while the Bible is true because they're not talking about exactly the same thing. Exactly. So, Two Dunn asks, and what is or was the purpose of feathers? I, I believe this is going back to dinosaurs. Um, so, I'm going to let you take a sip really quickly. Um, we know that uh, due to some fabulous work on Sinusoropteryx in China, no, I'm not going to say China, but was it China? I believe it's China, right? Yeah, Sinusoropteryx. Um, they were actually able to find little pigments in the feathery structures. And they were actually able to basically reconstruct what the feather would have looked like in color. And they actually found out that it, it was like white and like ginger, ginger and white, like striped dinosaur. And I believe they also did that with Archaeopteryx. Um, and it came out with a darker uh, purplish sort of a, sort of a feathery coat. So, you know, we know that dinosaurs may have used their feathers for, um, what am I looking for? For a show, you know, to fight off against, you know, the bad guys and everything, right? And they might have also used their feathers, we know that they used their feathers for flight, not powered flight, but gliding. We see this in Microraptor, which had four, you know, four, uh, two set, two pairs of wings um, on its on its arms and on its legs, right? And then we also see this in Sinosaurus uh, and a couple of others, Archaeopteryx uh, being one of them. So, you know, they were used for flight, they were used for show, and they were probably also used for uh, for warmth. I'm, I'm pretty sure they had, like, those fluffy feathers that chickens, or not chickens, maybe chickens have. Um, but, you know, let, let's, get your, let's get your opinion. Yeah, um, I mean, I would, I would agree. I think um, it's, first of all, you need to remember is that not all feathers look the same. So when we think of a feather, we're thinking of a, what we call right. a um, plumulate, or sorry, a penaceous feather. Um, and so that's the one that has the vein and the, the shafts that go off and all the, the complexity and it's used for flight and stuff. But birds have different types of feathers throughout their bodies and different kinds of birds have different types of feathers. And so um, when we're talking about like a tyrannosauroid having feathers, like Eutyrannus, um, we're saying that it has like single or possibly a few um, bristly kinds of structures that are like the single shaft or like a or, or vein or like little bristles. More um, like hair. Like more on a, uh, yeah, yeah, it'd be more like the downy fluff on a chick or um, quills right. or things like that that are that are homologous, chemically similar and everything to feathers. Um, and so, you know, they're not using them for flight, obviously, those ones. Um, but feathers serve lots of purposes. Um, it's integument for, um, for protection, for warmth, for show, for camouflage, all kinds of different things. And then, as you said, some of them would have been able to glide or, or fly. Exactly, exactly. So we've crossed a little bit over the hour mark. I want to say, everyone, in the chat, first of all, um, thanks so much for being with us. We're, we really appreciate you uh, being with us for this one. Um, and of course to Dr. Uh, Dr. McLean, I don't know why that slipped out of my mind, but Dr. McLean, thanks so much for being with me and yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And so maybe if you have more time in the future, maybe we sh maybe we could do another one, one of these again. Um, maybe we can invite Dr. Ross on and we, we can have like a, uh, like a conversation with the two of you at the same time to him so yeah <laughs> that's always good yeah he, he, he's actually really he's a, he's a really great guy so thanks so much everyone for tuning in tonight uh i want to give a shout out to the chat room valid core soul baron brother garcia and tudon and faithful word baptist 1611 and matt mcclellan 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 i don't know how to pronounce 